All right, welcome to the show. Welcome to uh, Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. I'm just uh, reading up on how UConn is stuck. UConn can't fly to Arizona. You can't, UConn's best chance of getting to Arizona anytime soon is to take some little puddle jumper that will have to come in from Left something open there, and uh, I, I started uh, hearing myself talking back to myself. That's never a good thing. You never want to hear yourself. Um, UConn's best chance of getting to Arizona is taking this little puddle jumper out of Cincinnati that uh, will fly to UConn and take them and have to stop and refuel on the way to Arizona in order for uh, UConn to make it. I was just reading about this before we started the show, which is why it's uh, sort of fresh in my brain. Everybody, The other three Final Four teams are already in Arizona. UConn might not get there. Like if they take their original plane, which got delayed due to something or other, they're not going to leave until like 10 a.m. tomorrow. So UConn's in a bit. I, I, I'm sure Danny Hurley is handling this really well. I mean, of, you know, I think he's he's a pretty balanced, uh, you know, individual. You know, manages emotions well, and I, and I think he's probably taking this this news and this development really well. I I'm sure there are no uh, flight attendants or flight uh, you know ticket takers or whatever they're called. Uh, getting yelled at right now. But anyway, we've got some pit things to talk about, of course, here on the Pantolaire Show. Glad you could join us here on a Wednesday night. Jim Hammond will be joining us uh, shortly. You know the deal. Like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash Pantolairecom is where we put all of our pit video content right here, whether it's our daily morning pit videos, Monday through Friday, our weekly live show, like we're doing right here every Wednesday night from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. If it's uh, press conferences and post games and interviews and practice highlights and all that kind of stuff, it's all right here at youtube.com slash pantalaircom. And so if you want to make sure you don't miss any of it, click the subscribe button and then you will be locked in for all of our video content. And while you're at it, like this video because we just like it when you do that. Of course, the website pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. And uh, message boards where pit fans talk to other pit fans all day, every day. Pit fans are hanging out on the message boards at pantalaire.com. They're talking about pit sports. I think it's the best online community of pit fans that you're going to find. And if you want to talk about pit sports at any point during the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the place to do it is the message boards at pantalaire.com. Obviously, a lot of conversation going on right now on the basketball message boards about Bub Carrington's departure, but that conversation didn't just start today at 1 o'clock when Bub Carrington made that announcement. It started yesterday when they announced that they were having a press conference with Jeff Capel and a, quote, select player, an unnamed mystery select player. Well, there was a lot of conversation about it last night, and if you were on the message boards last night or this morning, you had a pretty good idea of what was going to be announced this afternoon. So that's why you want to be on the message boards at pantherlair.com if you are a pit fan. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. All right, let's bring in our good friend, Jim Hammett. Jim is here, as always, from uh, Johnstown. And I don't know if the tornadoes are flowing through Johnstown, but Jim, you, you, you've got a, a questionable signal there, my man. Doesn't look... Is your internet okay? I, is it not okay? You sound okay. You're not very clear, though. You look, um, oh. you look pixelated a bit. Oh. I don't know. It's, it looks fine on my screen. You sound good. We can hear you, though. I mean, well, yeah, you look good on your screen because you're you're watching like your webcam. I mean, that's. I, I don't think that's really. Well, maybe that maybe you're watching it through Streamyard. I'm not sure, but are you having any inclement weather there, Jim? Yeah, I, I don't think it stopped raining in uh, about 30 hours, and if, if you know where I'm from. Uh, Johnstown is known to flood every once in a while, so I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm looking outside, seeing what's going on. Did you say it's been raining for three hours? Is that what you 30. said? Thirty. Thirty. Okay, I was gonna say because it's been raining here for like three days. Did you see the picture? The point is underwater now. I mean, did yeah. you see this photo? It's crazy yeah, stuff. Do you, do you remember? Like, I think it was 2004, Pitt, Nebraska. Nebraska, like, yeah. <laughs> the boats were just floating down the river. Like, everyone was yeah. just like, all right, like, I'm going to the game. There's my boat floating down the river. There's nothing mm -hmm. I can do. So, yeah, that was pretty crazy. And it, it kind of looked like that. When you uh, you used to be able to, like, before they really built up the, it's not even an open end of the end zone anymore or open end of the stadium. But when it used to be open, you could look out. You know, if you go out of that gate on the north end of the stadium, you can walk down steps, you know, where the band, like, gathers yeah. to play. It's like, I mean, there was like water there, and you could see it from the press box. You're like, "Look, there's like water floating up," and that was when yeah, the boat was like uh, 
lodged up on the steps at the point. Like it was just, it just left it there when the waters receded. I feel like it sat there for quite a while too, before they finally took that thing down. But yeah, hopefully it's going to stop raining at, at some point. We had a tornado warning overnight. So that was, uh, that was interesting. I, I didn't really think we were going to get a tornado, but anytime they start talking like that. So that's why I was worried that when I saw your, uh, pixelated screen, I was worried you were dealing with, um, tornadoes there. Uh, maybe Danny Hurley's dealing with that as well. Have you ever flown to Connecticut, Jim? Real quick, before we get into the important things, have you ever flown to Connecticut? No. And whatever you talked about, like the puddle jumper, like the plane they have to take, like I immediately thought of like major league. You remember that little plane? Like they have to like get on and like, she's like, Oh, they're, we caught all these guys too much. Here's this plane. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like a storm and they're flying somewhere. I, I, that's what I picture UConn doing right now. Well, what's funny about that is the the thread I was reading about is, is that the NCAA is like responsible for travel during the tournament. Like they yeah. book the travel for the final four teams. I guess. I don't know how far that goes if it's the entire tournament or, or if it's just in the final four. But like, so the NCAA put them on this flight that I, I guess there was something like a plane coming in from Kansas City had major mechanical delays and that backed everything up for everybody. And so their flight crew couldn't go because they'd be over their hours and all this stuff. But I, I flew to Connecticut once for a pit game and it was like 2008 and my flight went through Cleveland, which I always bring up as like my most ridiculous, like layover locations to fly from Pittsburgh to Cleveland to like Hartford or wherever it was. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, why am I flying through Cleveland to get here? So I drove the, the other times I went up there and that was, that's a terrible drive. That's like eight hours and, when I was a younger man, that was okay, but I could never imagine doing that now unless we're going to like the beach or something. But anyway, I'm getting a far too sidetracked here. A big day um, for news and whatnot. Uh, obviously, with the Bub Carrington departure, Jim, uh, you know, I, I, we knew that was um, getting announced. Well, I, I shouldn't even say we knew that was getting announced. I mean, we did, but we always knew this was a possibility, right? I, I don't think there was any surprise about Bub Carrington deciding to leave for the NBA. I, I thought there was a possibility he might just enter the draft process like Blake Hinson did last year, like Justin Champagny did before Champagny ultimately decided to go to the NBA. Um, I thought he might do that. Did, did you also think he was going to do that? Or, or did you think, yeah, this is probably what he'll do. He'll just dive headlong and just be like, nope, I'm going to the NBA. I'm done. I, I kind of thought he would go through the process. And I, I, I noticed in the, the release that Pitt sent, they, they still had that wording, like, will maintain eligibility. And I don't think he's doing that. But I, I guess in this day and age, I, I don't think like, the whole list of I mean, agents thing matters anymore. They already have agents. They're already talking to people. So, I mean, I guess if he, like, trips and turns his ankle and can't go through the pre-draft process, maybe he comes back to Pitt. But, like, I, it was weird that, like, they said one thing and they sent the release and it said another thing, but yeah, I mean, I, he's going to the NBA. Um, I, I don't think he's testing the waters. Like I, that was yeah. his goodbye to Pittsburgh today. And I, I am a little surprised by that. I thought he would go through the process, but I mean, he was really good down the stretch. I mean, that game against North Carolina against, you know, a really good sweet 16 caliber team. He was the best player on the floor. I mean, he, he, he is that good. He looked really good. You know, I'd say maybe best, three weeks of the season like he, he just turned it on and you can see why scouts love him and it, it that started back in his first game of his career I mean he jumped on the scene unlike any pit player I've ever seen and he was immediately thought of as a draft prospect he had some rough patches and but finished strong and I'm not really surprised this is how it ended up yeah I, on the note of that press release it, you, you're right the headline in the email says Carrington to test NBA draft draft process retain eligibility at Pitt I think that was an error that it was included there. I don't think that was supposed to be in the headline because in the very first paragraph, it says Carrington's the second pit player under Jeff Capel to bypass college eligibility to enter the NBA draft. Like it, it, it is not, he's not, I mean, like, yes, technically he has eligibility, but he's not retaining eligibility. He's not entertaining the possibility yeah. of coming back to pit. He's done. It, it's over. I think that was a, a, a typo. I, my guess is that the press release was written and ready to be sent out maybe a couple days ago and then the, it was made clear and also he's not coming back but that part didn't get taken out of the headline of the email but yeah he made it very clear he was even asked directly you know are, are you going to sort of keep the the, the door open and he's you know said no i mean he's he's done he's moving on um it seems like the consensus is that this is not a 
great draft class. That that's what you've seen too, right? Like yeah. not not necessarily particulars, but like that seems to be the general overall sentiment, right? That had to have been a part of this, don't you think? I think so. And I, I think if this is considered a weak draft class, then there must be something, you know, coming up the system next year and it's going to be a stronger draft class. So he could be an even better player next year, but he might not be that same level of prospect. So I think uh, just the combination, he's young, he had a good year, he's probably hearing good things, and I think it's going to work out for him. I, I mean, I, I know there was a lot of like talk on our message boards today, and they're, you know, they, they see some mock drafts. I don't think Bob Carrington's making his decisions off a mock draft on ESPN.com. Hmm. Like, I, I, I think, like, you know, the way Jeff Capel had it worded, he's like, I talked to some GMs, I talked to some people, and I, he, he started to say, I think he's going to be a first. Then he goes, I know he's going to be a first round pick. So, yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing's ever set in stone and a lot can change between now and the end of June. But I mean, I'm looking NBA draft right, dot net right now. He's the eighth pick. I mean, <laughs> that's one mock draft. So, I mean, I, I think he made the right call. And, you know, even if he falls out of the first round and goes to the second round, I mean, you're talking about like a two way deal and that's kind of what he would get paid as an, you know, a college athlete at, with NIL. I mean, I, I think just getting on that track of being in the NBA is the right move for him. And even if he falls to late in the first round, then that means he's going to a good team and he can kind of be brought up slowly and go to their G League team and they can kind of stash him away for a year. So he's going to be making me playing professional basketball next year. And I, I think there's a chance he could really, you know, kind of overcome some of these projections and maybe sneak into the lottery like a few of them. So the eighth pick, that's Utah? Is that uh this, is this that mock draft him? has him going eighth to Houston. Houston. Oh, okay. Tankathon.com has the 2024 NBA draft order with Houston at eight. This we're showing our uh um lack of uh knowledge about the NBA draft, I guess. Uh wait, here, I'll go to NBA.com. We should be able to take this at its word, right? Well, I mean, well, it, it, but that's just not, the picks. It's, they don't have it's not set yet. I mean, they're, they're oh, still, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Season. You're right. You're right. What am I? Yeah. Why? It's, why not, it's, not, the, it's not the NFL. They don't have it <laughs> just yet. So <laughs> they don't. Okay. Well, so Scott Eisenberg asked us, uh, um, this has me thinking that Bub has really good intel that he'll be a first rounder and probably pretty high. What pick do you think? What pick do you think he'll go? <laughs> We're going to hold you to your predictions forever. Um, so you said that site had him projected at eight. I'm going to say seven since that's the jersey number he wore and he was the first pit player to ever wear the jersey number seven. So I'm going to say seven. What's your number? Are you, are you picking eight, Jim? Um, yeah, just to be different, I'll go ten. 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 Okay. All right. I wonder who that might be. What did uh, Tankathon, Tankathon.com thinks that'll be uh, Atlanta. So. I don't know what would be like. Uh, I, I mean, I can't even begin to pretend like I have any idea about fit. But like, uh, would like Washington be good? Like, relatively close to home. That's probably the closest team to home for him, right? I mean, would that be uh, the 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 most fun fit for him, or or w would you pick like um like Cleveland because it'd be the most like the closest to Pittsburgh, the easiest to uh, see him play. I mean, I, I don't think it would be a lot of fun to go play for the Wizards right now just because they're terrible. I, I mean, like, I guess he would get some playing time. It isn't Justin Shaney? He's getting some minutes with them right now. So Yeah, there you go. I would, I, actually, I, I, I'm back on board with the Wizards. <laughs> and uh, Champagne and uh, Carrington on the same team. I think that would be kind of cool. But I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the idea of, like, what if he falls to someone like Boston or, you know, like gets to play, like, on a contender right away? Like, even if you're, like, at the end of the bench, like, that's incredible experience. and it would be kind of cool to see him, like, you know, on a playoff team next year. Maybe, you know, it, 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 there's so many ways it can go. And we're so focused on Pitt and college basketball. It's like, I don't have a ton of time for the NBA. Like, I just don't. <laughs> so, like, I don't I don't know yeah. what's going on. I, I'm a Knicks fan. I, I don't really know why. I just have been. Uh, so, yeah, okay. it would be cool if he goes to the Knicks, I guess. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. So, I mean, as far as Pitt goes, Pitt next year. I keep sort of saying that if if Bub Carrington had come back, and obviously part of it will hinge on what they're able to do with the, with the portal to, to fill the four and the five spot, um, but I keep saying that I, I feel like the expectation would have been Sweet 16. W would you put the expectation that high? And, and obviously it's going to depend on who they can get to fill the four and the five, but would you put the expectation that high if they had 
if Carrington had come back along with Lowe and Leggett um, to be a, a Sweet 16 team? I think so. I mean, I, I, I think I, I've been kind of saying that for weeks now. I, I thought they would, you know, whenever these way too early top 25s come out, like right after UConn wins the championship on Monday, like I thought Pitt was going to be on it if Carrington was around. Like I, right. it, it, that, that would have been one of the best backcourts in the country. So I, I think, yeah, you kind of, with, with Bob going, you know, moving on, you lose out on that preseason notoriety. You lose out on that like buzz nationally, but I still think they have a chance to be pretty good, but like you miss that, like that whole part of it. And, you know, maybe being picked to be one of the top three or four teams in the ACC. So, yeah, I mean, in that regard, it's a blow and obviously on the court, it's a blow, but I, I mean, I, I think with Carrington, that would have been a really good team next year. So where would you set the, and again, now, now they have to fill three spots, right? They have to fill the four and the five and, and get another guard. Conceivably, does it just roll back to like the goal is to make the tournament? You know what I mean? Is that kind of where they're at? I mean, pending who they get, but is that where the expectations are again now? Yeah. I mean, I think any college basketball team, I mean, you want to get in the dance and see what happens. And they, you know, NC state's on a run. You just need a chance to get in. And I think, I think Pitt's going to be in a position to win 20 games again, be in the top half of the ACC, and we'll see if that's good enough for the committee next year. But I think that's what they can be. I mean, they went from having possibly one, having one of the best backcourts in the country to they still have one of the best backcourts in the ACC. I think Jalen Lowe is going to be a really good basketball player. Like sophomore Jalen Lowe is going to be something to see, and I, I think it's going to really kind of thrive off him. So it's hard to say until the roster's fulfilled. But, I mean, given the track record lately, they, they've been pretty good in the portal. Um, they have some pieces in place. I think, you know, judging by who was in the crowd watching Bob uh, announce today, I don't think anyone else is leaving. I mean, I think I think they have you know, nine guys right now with four spots to fill, and we'll see how those four spots kind of play out. What do you – so, I mean, what do they lose the most? I mean, it's it's another ball handler. It's – like a mid-range guy, right? Three-point shooting, I, I, I guess. Like, what, what do you feel? Like, I mean, he's he's a great player. I don't think there's any question about it. But what do you feel like is the like if you're going to sort of quantify it? I mean, obviously, there's the scoring. He averaged 14 points per game. He was this, you know second leading rebounder. He led the team in assists last year. Um, what do you feel like they're going to miss the most with Carrington going? I mean, I, I think it's just the just like having the frontline talent, like having an all ACC caliber player. I mean, I, I think there's ways they can offset his production, but just having that one guy that can do it all, like you said, that he's really, you know, second on the team in rebounds, you know, led the team in assists. Like he does a little bit of everything. So he had his hand in a lot of things. And I thought by the end of the year, he was a pretty good defender too. And I mean, I, it, yeah. these past two seasons, you know, it's won 20 games each time. They've really done well because they've had two point guards on the floor. I, I mean, it was, you know, it was Cummings and Burton, and, and you know, last year was, you know, Carrington and Lowe. So, I mean, I think Leggett can kind of do that. Uh, I think there's a chance they can get another guard. But, like, you, the, they've had their most success when they've had two point guards on the floor. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that kind of gets replaced. Well, yeah, that I mean, that kind of leads into the question of, like, what they need – to get now. I mean, I, like Jeff Gable said, well, we got to get a guard now. And I mean, I think there's no question about it. I think they had a few irons. I think they had made contact with a few guys to try and prepare for this, you know, possibility. I, I think they thought they were going to have to wait longer um, to find out what Bob Carrington's, what Bob Carrington was going to do. I think it helps them to have him do it earlier, to have him decide here on April 3rd, as opposed to May 3rd, that he's going to go to the NBA because it gives them that much more time. I mean, it would have been nice if he could have done it like a week ago. So they, uh, you know, could get maybe a visit or two in before this dead period starts tomorrow. Um, but it gives them more time to try to work on guys, to try to bring some guys in and and, and potentially to find like a, a top guard. I'm just curious about like what kind of guard they need, though. Like, I, I think you're right about needing, you know, having two point guards. I think that's a big part of it. I think that was a big part of the success they had this year. But at the same time, it kind of feels like they need like a, a, a two guard. You know, and I don't know Brandon Cummings. I mean, I think he could fill that role uh, potentially down the road, but I don't think he's going to be like a 32, 33, 34 minute per game guy. So I think that's probably the kind of player you need. Now, if you could find a two guard who can handle the ball, that's great. If you could find like, I think that I would probably describe Bub Carrington's skill set like that as a two guard who can handle the ball. 
but I don't know they're going to find another guy like that. So to me, I, I, I'm almost sort of looking like, like, I don't think you need a Joe Girard. You know, I think you need somebody who could be a little bit more explosive and, and score at more than just one level. Um, whereas I think Gerard is pretty limited to just shooting threes. But I do think you you probably want to find somebody who's going to be able to make threes because you're you're probably not going to find another four who can shoot threes the way Blake Henson did. I think Low and Leggett can make some, uh, but I think you're going to have a lot of volume to make up. And even if next year's team is not as dependent on the three-point shot, you're still going to need somebody to shoot that. So I, I guess, you know, I mean, what, I mean, like, I guess I'm saying I think I would prioritize the three point shooting, we, but it can't be a guy who's just, it can't be a Greg Elliott. I don't know. Could it be? I mean, could like, would that be a good fit to get like a Greg Elliott, a, a Joe Girard type who, who just shoots threes and doesn't really do anything else? Yeah. I mean, because you have to look at the strengths of what Le- Low and Leggett do. I mean, Leggett's really good off the bounce, he, he's going to drive the lane. I don't know if he's really going to initiate offense for other people, but I think his strength is going downhill and scoring that way or, you know, scoring in transition, that kind of stuff. And I think Jalen does a little bit of both. He can shoot threes. He's going to penetrate. He's going to set up his teammates. So, yeah, I mean, I I think you want that extra shooter. And, I mean, truth be told, they're not going to find Blake Henson again for next season. They're not going to have 100 three-pointers from the four spot. So I I do think that third guard, that extra guard, needs to be someone that – I don't know he necessarily needs to just be a straight sniper like Greg Elliott, like you said, but they, they need someone to be able to stretch the floor and knock things down. So yeah, I, I don't know. And like, the weird thing with the portal is I, I texted you earlier. It's like, there's a good player entering like every 20 minutes. Like it's like, Oh, there's the mountain West player of the year. Oh, there's this guy. It's like, mm-hmm. Holy crap. Like, so, you know, I, I know, you know, everyone was a little upset. They missed out on Brandon Johnson today. There's going to be like ten more Brandon Johnsons like in the portal by the end of like the week. So it, it's it's a really yeah. crazy process. It's kind of hard to really get a grasp on it. It's like I, I started working on a big board I was going to give for you guys and you know try to release it by the end of the week. It changes every day. I can't <laughs> I can't stay on top of it. So yeah, it's just one of those things. So it, it, portal madness is crazy. So I don't know what they're going to get, but I think they have something to sell. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm sure on your big board, you were working on Brandon Johnson was prominently featured delete, and then delete, delete. the, yep, that was a, uh, yeah, you had to backspace a lot on that one because it was, it was gone. Um, Scott Eisenberg says that with, uh, Bub Carrington leaving, they lose shot creation and a lot of spacing threat, uh, including Blake Henson. The, the one thing about Bub, and, and I think the one thing you need to improve the most is, and we talked about it all season, it's finishing at the rim. Um, but I do think his penetration was, was such a threat and he was good enough that it it did create a lot of space and a lot of kickout opportunities. I think Jalen Lowe can do a lot of that. I, I'm going to be interested to see... Like, Jalen Lowe is smaller than Bob Carrington, right? I, I mean, that's, that's obvious. You see them on the court. I don't know, and I don't know that he can handle the kind of contact that Ishmael Leggett takes, right? So I guess I'm, I'm looking for, like, where Lowe's game evolves... To next year. I, I agree with you. I think he's going to be really good as a sophomore. I think he was really good as a freshman. Um, I think he can drive. I think he, that first step is so quick that you just give him a little bit of daylight and boom, he's gone. He's left-handed so he can finish both sides. Um, he's a good He's a good shooter. He can pull up. Um, you know, He can shoot the mid-range. He, I think he can get to the basket, not necessarily to the rim because I, I don't think he can jump all that high, uh, but he can shoot from outside as well. What is he going to have to do, or is he going to have to do something to sort of make up for the absence of Bub? You know what I mean? Or, or is that just going to fall to whoever they bring in? You know what I mean? I, yeah, it's hard to say, like, he needs to shoulder some of Bub's responsibility because he, he was doing his own thing. He was such, he was as important, if not more important, than Bub during, like, kind of, like, that January push. Like, he, he was actually the better player for a little while. So I don't know if he needs to change his game to, like, make up for Bob. I think he just needs to be himself, and I think he can be a really good player himself. I don't there, – there's nothing he really needs to change or needs to emulate. I mean, he's a good shooter. He's He can drive, pretty good defender. He's a smart player. I mean, he's he's the true point guard. He's the you kind of what you look for in a college player, like college point guard. I mean, I think, you know, he and Jeff Capel have a pretty good connection. That They always talk about that extension on the court. I think that's what Jalen Lowe can be. So I, I don't think he needs to try to be Bob. I think he just needs to try to be himself. 
Yeah. Anthony Tennyson says, uh, I'm happy for Bub, and it opens up another scholarship, and there should be enough money now to get two really good portal guys. The only thing is they need three, <laughs> right? I mean, they need three really good portal guys. They need a really good four. Um, I think they, you know, they need a center and they need that other guard, like we were talking about. Is there any of those spots that let's say one needed to be deprioritized or or lesser, you know, lowered on the priority chain. And I'm not necessarily sure if there if, if that's the case or not, but if there was one, it, you know, would you lower like center because they have Guillermo back and they're bringing, you know, Papa Conti will be available. Would you lower like the four? I feel like the four is a pretty important spot where they could, you know, maybe have the, the highest possibility of getting a, a, an impact player. You know what I mean? Whereas like, the big time impact center, the guy who's going to average a double double or whatever, is probably going to be priced out of their range. You know what I mean? For what they need to get and what the, the budget that they're going to have available. But I feel like you could probably get a four who might get overlooked a little bit, but fits well into what they want to do, who might be able to rebound pretty well and, and maybe make a few shots. So I don't know, like needing three guys now. Do, does one of those positions get like bumped down the priority list for you, Jim? Yeah, I mean, I think realistically, getting a great center is going to be a tough pull. And like I, I've been saying, I think everyone said for years now. I mean, college basketball is driven by backcourts. Well, this is a bad year to make that case. Looking at the Final Four with like Klingon, Edie, uh, you know, all, like DJ, DJ. Burns, and, like yeah. the, like the 2005 era big man is back in the Final Four <laughs> this year. Um, but, I, I mean, I think you can be successful without having a great center. I mean, I think last year's team kind of pointed to that. I think Federico was not a great player, but they had good players around him, and he just kind of needed to fill his role. So, I mean, I think they could go that direction again. I mean, but they still are in the mix for, you know, Brandon Huntley-Hatfield. I mean, that, that would be a great pull for them. I mean, obviously, they're going up against two of the final four teams, so that might be a tough one to land. But I mean, I think of the three, I, mean, I think they do need that stretch for. I think that's a big part of what they do. And I do think they need another shooting guard. So, I mean, if I had to rank them, I would probably put center, you know, third on that list. Yeah, which is weird because it really felt like that could be the piece that could put them over the top is mm -hmm. to get that center. But I, I kind of agree. I mean, I think some of these other things are a bigger priority. Do you think this opens up more opportunity for Brandon Cummings, though? Like, uh, I, like, I, I don't know what to, I still don't really know what to expect out of him because I just don't ever really want to put too high of expectations on freshmen outside of like the top 10 guys in the class. Um, but he was going to be the number four guard. If they do well in the portal, he'll be the number four guard again. But we saw them get through, get by with three guards last year. Do, do you see like, what, what kind of role do you think he'll have? And does that change with Bub Carrington leaving? I mean, I, but yeah, I, th I think it changes. I mean, I think it could be an increased role. It, it kind of depends, again, what they fill in the portal. But I think he's a talented player. I think they were kind of planning on, you know, I think there's belief that he could come in and play. I mean, I think they trust, you know, who he is. They know him as a family. They know everything about him. I mean, he's been committed forever. He comes to every game. So he's basically on the team already. So <laughs> I think they have a pretty good idea. And I think the expectations, you know, within the program are pretty high for him. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to be Bob Carrington next year, but I, I think he could come in and have a role. But again, it's hard to say. I mean, he's what, like the 137th prospect in the country. I mean, you never know what you're getting. And it's not like Western PA is like the greatest high school basketball in the world. I mean, he's playing you know, just your run of the mill Hamptons and Union Towns and it's he's not playing IMG Academy. So it's kind of hard to get a total feel for what he can do. But he had an impressive high school run this year. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty uh pretty um he's pretty impressive. You know, I mean obviously I, I'm just looking at some of these comments here and William Richter brings up Malik Thomas. You know, I mean as we talk about Brandon Cummings, we talk about Lincoln Park, there's there's the Malik Thomas. I mean I, I still hear that it's not expected that he'll reclassify. Um, I don't I, like, I don't think anything definitive has come out about that, but I mean, obviously that would be a big boost if they could get him, if he would reclassify and he would come in and join the team. I mean, Holy cow, like what that would do. But I, I, I I'm sort of of the mind of like pit fans should probably just stop thinking about that possibility. Still keep 
you know, realize that, you know, Thomas is a priority. He's a huge target for them, but it's highly unlikely to happen. Or I, I think Pitt fans should at least take that mentality. You know what I mean? So they can stop wondering if it's going to happen. And then if it does, like, wow, that's a great surprise, but sort of just set it aside. You know what I mean? I agree. Like, I don't, I don't think like Bob announcing it was like a tic-tac-toe, like now he's coming. Like I, I, there's a lot of things in play. And, you know, one of the things I brought up earlier is he can sit back and watch because he doesn't have to reclassify. He can come back and play at Lincoln Park next year. So right. he could, he could see how the portal shapes up and see what roster looks appealing and who has money left from their NIL. I mean, he, he doesn't have to play college basketball next year. So I mean, you know, kind of chip, everything's in his court. It's it's up to him what he wants to do. So I, I'm with you. I mean, it depends who you talk to. I've, I've heard some people are convinced he's definitely reclassifying and other people saying, like, I don't think that's happening. So nobody really knows. And I don't think he necessarily knows. I think even after the state championship, I, he was asked and he's he said, I, I don't know. You can ask my head coach. And like, what, what's his high school head coach know about anything? So, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't think he knows yet. Right. Uh, William Richter uh, also said, it's a great day for Pitt basketball. Having a star head to the draft proves Pitt can develop and send players to the NBA. So this sort of dovetails nicely into uh, the the what was actually, I think, the biggest conversation point on the message boards. Not about Bub Carrington leaving. Not about the impact on the basketball team. Not about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for next year's team or how they'll replace him or what he brought or any, or how he'll do in the NBA or anything like that about the question of whether or not they were, or why Pitt was having a press conference to announce this. And, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, Jim, I've been pretty good at predicting Pitt fans' cynical responses to things for years. I mean, I've dealt with it. I've lived with it. Um, I babysat it for, for almost two decades. So I have a pretty good feel for, you know, how, you know, when Pitt fans are going to overreact to something that's largely inconsequential, but I didn't see this one coming. I did not see the, the outrage uh, over holding a press conference coming. But boy, it blew up on the message boards yesterday. It blew up again today. People just talk about how how ridiculous it is that, that Pitt held a press conference to announce this. They could just be done with a tweet and all this kind of thing. I didn't, I, I, I was shocked. I, and I shouldn't be shocked. And I rarely get shocked by fan reaction anymore. I was shocked by this one. Were you surprised that people got this upset about the fact that, not about the fact that Bub was leaving, but about the fact that, um, they were holding a press conference to announce it. Yeah, it kind of all happened in real time. And, you know, for a while we were on pace, to, like match the, the Efton Reed thread. I mean, like that, that <laughs> thing was jumping this morning. So it was like pages and pages in a couple hours. But I, I, I mean, the thing I thought about it is whenever it was first announced, I, I think I tweeted a picture and I was like, hmm, wonder what this could be about. Then everyone's imagination was wild. Yeah. Everyone's like, what could this be? Oh, it must be and he's coming back or this guy's coming back or this or that. And like, I think everyone just built it up in their heads so much that whatever I think, whatever you kind of let everyone know that, yeah, he's going to the NBA. I think everyone just kind of felt the plate like this. This is what it is. We're going to celebrate our best player leaving. And like, I, I don't think it was that, but I, I think everyone just kind of got caught up in thinking it was going to be something like good. And it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I, I just like, it, like, you're probably right. Because the question I just could never answer is like, well, what's the downside? Like, okay, maybe this will uh, look good for Pitt. Maybe it won't. I, like, maybe it'll be a good commercial for Pitt. Maybe it won't really get much reaction. But like, there's no downside in doing this. And, and like I said in the one thread, and I think you agreed, like, yes, he could just tweet it. But I'd much rather have an opportunity to like ask questions and hear him actually talk about it than just retweet his tweet. I mean, it's far more interesting. We have a 20-minute video here at youtube.com slash panthalaircom and a friggin' like 3,300-word transcript of everything Jeff Capel and Bub Carrington said on panthalair.com. And that's far more interesting than just retweeting like a, a stupid graphic. You know what I mean? With like, you know, 150 words about how much he thanks everybody at Pitt who helped him get to this point. Which, I mean, there was one of those, too. And it's far more interesting to actually hear him talk and hear Jeff Capel talk about it. You know, and uh, so I, I just didn't get, like, the outrage. And I guess you're probably right. Maybe they built it up. And, and, and the problem was the, the theories that started emerging. Like, people were talking about, like, the James Conner, um, like, press conference when he announced that he had cancer. And I was like, oh, God, we can't go down this. Like, guys, like, let's bring this back here. Like, this is none of the things you're talking about. It's not about a practice facility. It's not about anybody being sick or anything like that. It, th this is what it is. Um, 
Now, it would be nice if next Wednesday they have a press conference and, you know, Jalen Lowe and Ishmael Leggett announce that they're coming back. You know, I think you should do that. But, you know, honestly, I think it might be up to the players. And if, if like, Lowe and Leggett are coming back and they just want to tweet it, I think Pitt will give them that opportunity. I think Bub Carrington and his family wanted to have this moment. And, and do it this way. And so Pitt obliged because why wouldn't you? This guy was a great player for you and helped you win a lot of games this year and, you know, got a little bit of extra national recognition for you. He's ACC Rookie of the Week a bunch of times and all this different stuff. So if he says he wants to have a press conference to announce this, I think you oblige because, again, like what's the downside in it? No, I, I didn't have a problem with the press conference. I mean, you kind of hear these guys' story. I mean, of all the tweets and commitments and everything we've seen on Twitter through the years. Have you ever read that paragraph before it says I'm committed to? No, I've never done it. I'm never going to. I scroll until I see where he committed. (laughs) So nobody reads those things. Like I didn't read Bubs today. Like I wanted to hear what he had to say. (laughs) I mean, I wanted to hear what Jeff Capel had to say about it. So, I mean, I, I thought that was interesting. I just, yeah. I mean, I think everything got built up last night and that, that, that was kind of the angst with it. But like, having the press conference, it, it, it wasn't a bad thing. And, like, we never got to, like, have that final press conference with Henson. I mean, it was just like, here's this video, I'm gone. And it's like, I don't know. He was a great guy in the media. He gave great quotes. And it's like, all right, he's over. Like, yeah. you know, so, like, I, I thought it was kind of cool to, like, you know, hear Bub's explanation and hear Capel's thoughts on things. And, I mean, you, you talk about, you know, having Ish and Low come out next Wednesday and do their thing. Well, Jeff kind of, like, let – let that out of the bag. He's like, well, yeah, we have two guards. We're excited that coming back. Like, I mean, like everyone knows they're coming back, but I, I mean, I guess if they want to do the announcement, they can. I think that's just how college sports are now. Yeah. I feel like Cable threw a hopefully in there. Let me see if I, I, I have the transcript uh, right in front of me. Let me do a, a... I don't, I don't think he did. I think it was, we have two guards. We're excited about next year. Uh, he, he said, um, uh, I wanted this moment to be very special for he and his family, but we'll pursue a guard. Hopefully we have some really good guards returning that we're excited about it, but we need to find another good guard and hopefully they'll see the way. I mean, he, yeah, he just, it, it was, it was sort of a throwaway, hopefully. Um, but I, I think that's just a matter of announcing it. You know what I mean? I, I think you and I both think low and legged are pretty well locked in um, to returning. Uh Turning our focus to the front court, TRR says Guillermo at the four seems so ideal, but all the talk has him at center. You can shoot the three for a four, and Conti and a grad transfer center should be the centers. We've talked about it at different points, Jim. What, what would you do with Guillermo next year? And some of it will depend on what else they bring in. Um, so that that's part of it. But what would be the ideal use for Guillermo next year? In college basketball, it's all about who you can defend. And I'm not exactly sure who Guillermo can defend. I don't know if, like, I trust him against a good center. I don't know if I trust him against a forward that can put the ball on the ground. I mean, I think he provides some rim protection as a, you know, as a five. So I think that's probably better suited for him. And he can create matchups for the other team defending him. So, I I mean, I think he's a center. I mean, like, I, I, I understand the whole, like, he could probably play the four. I think his offensive game fits it. But... I mean, a lot of it, like, I think positions kind of come back to defense. It's all about who you can defend. And I, I don't really necessarily love whenever he has to guard, like, people like Armando Baycott, but I don't know where else you stick him. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a shame because he, he he does offer you a decent amount offensively. You know, I mean, like, a, the the threes are a real threat, and that can that can really impact how teams are defending you, but – yeah, you've you've got to be able to defend, and you're going to get you should be able to get what you need offensively from the other players on the court. Um, you know that you don't need to sell out for offense all the time. I, I just, I, I mean, I guess the starter at center then has to be a transfer, right? I mean, the the starter at four and five have to be transfers. I mean, like, do you see any yeah. possibility where that's not the case? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, let's just. Like, let's play a little devil's advocate here. What if they don't put a lot of stock into adding a center and they feel comfortable with Guillermo and Papa? Then you just kind of really go for it with on the perimeter. I mean, is that something they could approach it? Like, all right, like we have so much NIL money, like let's get the best possible four and the best possible shooting guard we can find. I mean, I don't think that's a bad route because I already said, I think of the three centers, probably the least. Right. Because I think Guillermo can give you 20 minutes. And I think 
you know, his numbers got better from freshman to sophomore, and I still think he's going to continue to get better as a player. So you don't really have that Guillermo option at the four right now or at shooting guard. You have it at center. So, I mean, I think of all the places you could kind of – I mean, you're going to tr try to add a center, but I don't know if you're going to get, like, the best center in the portal, and you might be okay with that. Well, TRR also has a solution. It says, uh, any chance Federico comes back at a cheaper cost? The staff has struggled since day one finding centers, but Federico was a good fit at least. No, nope, I don't see any chance of that. Jim, you? Nope. Nope. Uh, sorry, TRR. Uh, um, let's see. Jeez, Homer Simpson. Actually... Uh, he says, I wish nothing but the best for the kid, but man, if, if Bob Carrington is the first round draft pick, the NBA is trash. Sorry, not sorry. Well, he's, I mean, I don't even like you called him Bob and you said the first round draft pick. I mean, he's going to be drafted in the first round. So, and I don't think that really means the NBA is trash. I think it means that he's an 18 year old who's going to be like maybe six, six or North of there who can drive, who can pull up, who can shoot from outside and will eventually get it, you know, add you know, finishing at the rim to his game. I mean, why wouldn't you draft a guy like that? Uh, nuclear natal says uh, Pitt will end with a mediocre, mediocre center at best. Cable can't recruit centers. I mean, I think centers, you know, are a little bit like um, tight ends, Jim. That, no, that's not a good example, but I don't think there are, there, there are a lot of them. You know, and, and I think the guys who were really, really like it used to be that for a while. I forget when this was. If it was late Jamie Dixon era of, uh, you know, Dixon just needs to go get a Juco center. He needs to go get that. Like, go get a Juco center. And I was like, guys, look, there's like four good Juco centers and they're not going to pit like they're going to like big schools. I mean, this was like 2013 or something like that. I, like, the, I think it's hard to get a really good center. I think you have to find. You, you know, for most teams, they're going to sacrifice something with their centers. Either they're not going to be a great defender or they're not going to, you know, it's going to be like Federico, who's like pretty much all defense and offers you nothing on offense. Maybe he can shoot from outside, but he's not going to have a great post-up game. Like for the vast majority of schools, those are the guys that you're going to get. Very few schools are going to get Kyle Filipowski, you know, or Zach Eady or, you know, whoever, take your pick. Even like like a PJ Hall or somebody like that. Like very few schools are going to get those guys because there's not that many of those guys to go around. So does Capel struggle to recruit centers, or is he just getting what he can get? You know, and and John Hughley was a pretty good prospect, and I think had a potential to be a pretty good player. Um, he was not without his shortcomings, but I think the best version of John Hughley would have been pretty good on last year's team and this year's team, you know, if you could have gotten like the best version of John Hughley as a team player, I think that would have made both of those teams better and probably got it been it worth at least like one or two wins. So that's a pretty good center that Capel recruited, right? Yeah. He was a top 100. Papa Conte is a top 100 recruit. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's not easy. Like you said, I mean, like, especially with the transfer portal era, uh, transfer portal era, geez. Um, yeah. But I mean, the thing with college basketball, I mean, like, it's weird, but like everyone has good guards. Like it, it's hard to get a really good center. And I mean, you you see like right now in the Final Four, like they have some good players. I mean, it's it, it, they're not growing on trees. And I mean, yeah, they signed two four star recruits at the center position in the past six years. I mean, I I think that's decent. Um, you'd like to see them do a little bit better in the transfer portal, getting one, but they're not deep. Did you oh. lose me? Oh, almost. Almost. You, 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 that was your longest uh, freeze yet, Jim. Oh boy. So, are you still here? I think so. All right, because your 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 pixelation has not improved, uh, but you're sounding so good that we're uh, we're all putting up with it. But um, you, uh, you 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 are freezing on occasion. But you want to uh, finish your thought there? Um, no, I mean it was just kind of <laughs> good. It's hard good to get. Center, yeah. Good centers aren't cheap. Yes, it's it's tough. Uh, Homer Simpson says, uh, I feel like Jeff Capel is more worried about developing players to the NBA than making Pitt a championship team. That's great for the kids, but not me. I mean, if Jeff Capel is more worried about developing players to the NBA, he hasn't done a very good job of it, right? What do they have, like two guys in the NBA? You know, like one guy in the NBA? Like, I, I'm not sure that's been his primary focus. I, it all runs hand in hand. 
right? Guess yeah. what? If you have players, you know, if you develop NBA talent, you're probably going to win a lot of games and win championships. I mean, most teams win championships because they have NBA talent. Now, yes, this year's team missed the NCAA tournament because it's NBA talent just so happened to be a freshman, um, you know, as opposed to maybe some guys who are a little bit older, a little bit more experienced. Um, but no, Capel's not more concerned about developing players in the NBA. I just wanted to bring that comment up to point out that I disagree about it. Uh, Scott Eisenberg says, putting Guillermo at the four, he says center here, but later corrected himself. Putting Guillermo at the four takes away his superpower as a pick-and-pop shooter from three against centers who are in drop coverage. Yeah, he's great at that. That's a major weapon. Um, it was great when he kept dragging DJ Burns out to the three-point line. <laughs> and Burns was like, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to keep running out there. It was awesome. But you like that's not the whole game. You know, that's something you can do like three times a game. And the other, whatever, like 38 minutes of the game or 39 minutes of the game, he's got to be able to function in other ways. And and I think he's at a major, I mean, he, he's at a, a, a disadvantage in most of those other things. So, I mean, that's a great thing to do. You just, you, you need more out of the center position. You got to be a little bit more well-rounded than that. I love it though, when he does it, right? I mean, it's great when Guillermo knocks down threes. It's a huge, like, uh, yeah, a secret weapon for this team, but. He's got to be able to do more. And I'm not sure, like, what other areas of his game can really come around you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what, what, it always comes back. He just needs to get stronger. That's what we said all last offseason. We'll probably say the same thing all this offseason. He just yeah. needs to get stronger. I mean, I yep. think that's what it comes down to. And, I mean, I thought he showed that at times this year. Like, how many times since freshman year both twins were on the ground, like, within 30 <laughs> seconds of check in? Like, that wasn't happening as much this year. And, I mean, I think there was a game this year, like, he got poked in the eye, and but he stayed in, and, like, the very next play, he finished something. And Jeff said, he's tough in his own way. Like, he's still – he's tough. He's not – not everyone that's tough has to be, like, jacked. Like, he has his own set of toughness. So, I think Guillermo is going to play a big role on that team next year. I mean, I think he's going to – all of his numbers are going to go up. Minutes, points, rebounds, all that stuff. Whether that equates to being a great starting center or just – you know, incrementally better than last year. I'm not sure yet. Um, let's see here. Uh, Hog Muncher wants to know any chance of the freed up NIL money goes to a stud recruit? Are there any rumors around a new four or five star commitment? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think something late, like, uh, you know, I guess the last two years they've pulled like a, a four star late in the process, right? Papa Conti was pretty late. Dior Johnson was pretty late, but I like, I, I think all, all focus right now is on the portal and, and that's where it should be. I mean, that's what they need. They need portal guys transfers to come in and, and play this year and start this year. I, I don't think they, I mean, sure. If you get Papa Conti to fall into your lap, if you get Dior Johnson to fall into your lap again, go for it. But you need, Guys who are going to play and play at a high level this year, you need experienced guys. You need transfers. Um, barring some like shocker, I don't. I don't see a whole lot of like redoubled efforts on on high school guys. Do you? No, I mean I think that's just one of those like they have four roster spots right now. I mean I think they're probably going to try to fill three of them, and you know they might carry that extra thirteenth spot in case a Dior Johnson pops up or a Papa Conte pops up. I mean. It's very rare that Pitt always has like the 13 man roster. I think Jeff Capel's always ready for that like late addition surprise, like we have an opening type thing. So, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be all portal here, like primarily. I think he's tried to go into seasons with the 13 man roster the last couple of years, but he hasn't made it to like December with 13 guys or he hasn't made it to January. You know, he, he might get back to 13 scholarship guys with a, a walk on going on, but. I feel like in August they have 13 scholarship guys, and then by January they are down. Uh, whether it was John Hughley leaving the team or Dior Johnson, um, and who knows what happened three years ago? Probably some other nonsense took place that you know caused the the, the roster to go down. Maybe a guy got hurt or something like that. Um, but you know, I I think he tries. So where are they at right now? So they were 13. Uh, Blake, KJ Marshall. Fetty, Will, and and Bub, right? So that puts them at eight. So they have five spots to fill. They have the two freshmen coming in. So they have three open scholarships, right? Am I counting that right? Um, Did I forget something? They're at nine. Nine? 
Leggett, Austin are the seniors. Guillermo and Jorge are the juniors. Jalen is the sophomore. Uh, Papa and Barnes are the redshirt freshmen. And Brandon Cummings and Omdi um, Nadi are the true freshmen. But ba- Yeah, Barnes. I forgot about Barnes. Was he, was he, was he, you think Marlon Barnes plays this year? You think he had, like where, what's his role? Three, backing up Zach Austin. I guess. I mean, I, I he was brought in. And I think he was known as a shooter. So I, I don't know. Maybe you have an extra three point weapon off the bench at some point. I, I don't think he's going to log big minutes, but he was brought in as a shooter. So yeah. yeah, I wonder about that. It's actually. I mean, Franklin King actually asked about it. Asked about what can be expected from Marlon Burns. I, I think that's an I'd like. He's a guy, he's just not on my, I mean, because he didn't play this year, he's just not on my radar at all. And, and I have no idea what to expect of him. I mean, like, we're talking about bringing in a transfer guard. Like, and, and when I think about that, I, I'm thinking about they want to bring in a transfer guard so they can play a lot of three guard lineups again. You know what I mean? So they can have low, legged, and the transfer playing at the same time. If you do that, you know, Zach Austin's minutes are going to be pretty limited, let alone whoever's playing behind Zach Austin. I mean, does Marlon Barnes get like, like Will Jeffress type minutes this year? Uh, I mean, like, does he get whatever would have been Jorge Diaz Graham minutes? And if he does, what happens to you know what I mean? Where's where's Jorge's minutes? I I guess I just don't. All these things always work out. They always come out in the wash. Yeah. But like, I'm not sure I know where he fits in this season. Does somebody else have to leave for Marlon Barnes to have a role? It, it's hard to say. Like until you know what. The other four guys on the roster are. I mean, it's I, I have no idea what Marlon Barnes can do. We didn't see it. And I mean, I think he was a decent prospect. He wasn't like an overly highly ranked with huge big time offers. I mean, he was I mean, part of his connection there was he went to the same high school as Sean Hughley, oddly enough. So I, I don't know what to expect from him. And it's it's hard to make any kind of, you know, proclamations until we know what the roster actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Just sort of projecting what we, just sort of you know, kind of talking out like what would be the ideal lineup. I mean, if it's low on a transfer starting, you know, Austin and then two transfers at the four and the five, and then your backups are Cummings and Leggett, because I think they might still want to bring Leggett off the bench. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Leggett still works in a reserve role and averages like 34 minutes per game, kind of like you did this past season where the the only difference is that he's not on the court for the tip off. Um, You know, so the three guards, low Leggett and, and the transfer play the bulk of the minutes. Cummings gets some. Austin starts, but again, you know, doesn't play a ton of minutes. Um, and then your transfer, and you have some mix, you have some combination of like transfers and Diaz Grams playing the four and the five. You know what I mean? Like that's that's sort of like that's probably the rotation, right? I mean, that's and I mean that's nine guys and it'll probably be shorter than that. So I don't know, but I guess they actually have to go get the transfer guard and the transfer forwards first. So I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of, a lot of strains to keep in the old Duter's head. Right. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Lad Scrimpton here just used pronouns. And so uh, I'll let you guess, who do you think he's talking about? He says his size and athleticism are top notch. He's big enough to guard a variety of positions. He's going to develop his outside shooting more and we'll get a better feel for the game as he gets older. Who do you think Lad Scrimpton's talking about? Uh, Bob. Bob. I, I think so too. He just posted it right under the question. What can be expected from Marlon Barnes? And I'm like, damn, you're really high on Marlon Barnes with all this. His size, you know, I, I, like I'm not saying you're wrong about Marlon Barnes, but like, I don't know any of that stuff. So I think he, I think that's part of like a different conversation Lad Scrimpton was having with other people about uh, Marlon Barnes. But I, uh, yeah, I was like looking at like, what, who, who are you talking about here? Are you talking is, about Marlon is Marlon Barnes, Barnes LeBron James? I, I, I mean, like, yeah, Bar- Bar- Bronny Barnes. Is that what's going on? <laughs> Um, is, is Marlon Barnes going to transfer to Duquesne too? Um, but anyway, uh, geez, we only got like six minutes left and we spent most of our time on this. Um, you know, overall thoughts on Bob. I mean, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing I thought that was, and I talk about this on, on, uh, I, I will talk about this on tomorrow's morning pit. I think one thing that was impressive about, impressive about Bob, he got such a hot start. I mean, obviously the triple double, those first four games, um, he was outstanding. He's average, he averaged like 18 points per game. And then he hit the Florida game. And and Oregon State and Clemson and Missouri. I mean, like, 
he started playing real competitions and it got really hard for him. You know, I mean, it got a lot harder than it was. He was at the top of the scouting report. Teams were getting physical with him. And and that was a, a eye-opening experience for him. Uh, but he adjusted to it. And, and it wasn't all like an up. It wasn't all improvement. You know, I mean, there, I think there were ups and downs. There were even points in the ACC schedule where, I mean, Jalen Lowe was outplaying him. You know, Ishmael Leggett was outplaying him. Obviously, Blake Henson. But he finished really strong. And, and I think it's a credit to him, the 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 work ethic, the commitment, um, the dedication to it and, and just the talent that, that he kept sort of grinding away uh, even when he, he faced, and I think he faced a lot of adversity this year because he became the guy that everybody knew about and, and he had to learn how to handle that and play with it and, and deal with it. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's impressive how, how he did that. And by the end of the year, I mean, there were definitely games in the last five and maybe the ACC tournament or at least, the, like you said, the Carolina game, where he was the best player on the court, or at least the best player on Pitt's roster, uh, after having some some real adversity, even as late as like February, I would say. I think he had some rough games in February, some rough games in January. So I think that's impressive, and I think it speaks to his commitment and 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 work ethic. You know what I mean? That he was able to keep grinding away, even though things got pretty tough for him at some point. You know? Yeah, I mean, it was weird because the, everyone kind of all you always hear about that freshman wall. And like he hit it, he definitely hit it, but he caught, he climbed over it. So I, I, that, you're right, it's impressive. And it was just weird that he was so good right off the bat. Like he was just like, oh my god, like this guy had a triple double. It's like the only, the third triple double in pit history. I mean, it's it's incredible. So uh, it was just a unique start to his career. I mean, where would you put Bob in terms of like just freshman at Pitt that you that you got to watch? Oh geez, I mean. I always have a soft spot in my heart for Dewan Blair. I, I mean, he just Dewan oh, yeah. was Dewan. You know what I mean? Like, and and like, you know, the passing of time has has colored how you know and, and affected how we view these guys. But I mean, Xavier Johnson was awesome as a freshman. You know what I mean? Trey McCallens, mm-hmm. Trey McCallens was really exciting as a freshman. Dewan is still like, I mean, but I'm partial to that because like those years, those were like formative pit basketball years for me, and so seeing him. As a freshman, the way he played, he was even better as a sophomore, but he was pretty great as a freshman. Um, he's he's pretty far up there. Uh, Bub, it's weird because Bub, like, there were so many things that stood out about this team. I mean, Jalen Lowe at points was like the best player on the court. You know what I mean? Blake Henson most of the time was the best player on the court. I mean, it was, it was a different kind of team to watch. So, I don't know. It's tough for me to... I feel like anytime anybody asks me any kind of like all time question about Pitt, my first answer pretty much to anything is Dewan Blair. It's like, oh, what <laughs> player would you start a team with, Dewan Blair? Like, who's the best of this, Dewan Blair? Who's the best of that, Dewan Blair? So I, I'm always sort of partial to Dewan just on anything, but I mean, the numbers are there. You know, I, I put it in the article, it's in all Pitt's press releases and stuff, like of where Bub ranks among Pitt freshmen all time. And it's, He's right up there at the top. He played as many minutes, scored as many points, and you know made as many threes as any of those guys. So I don't know. It's tough. He's 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 no worse than like two or three. I'll say that. What about you? What do you think? Yeah, I mean he's up there for me, and yeah, I was kind of keeping track of this like as, as he was as his season was getting better. I was kind of watching like is he getting close to Sean Miller's you know assist record or you know this scoring record for Charles Smith and. It's actually funny, like Xavier Johnson is actually at the top for most of those. Like, <laughs> like, and like, like I know Xavier Johnson is who he is and Pitt fans feel about him. But like the year he was on the all ACC freshman team, it was like the four starters from Duke with Zion Williamson and like Xavier Johnson, this little three star from like Washington, D.C. <laughs> on like a last place Pitt team. I mean, the kid was good that year. So, yeah, that, that was, he was fun to watch. He was. He was. Uh, he was outstanding. All right, last one. Um, before we bid adieu to uh, tonight's podcast, Nuclear Nadal says, "What do you guys think Pitt's chances are with Adu Thero?" Uh, I, I don't. I think we're probably in agreement. I, I don't really see that happening. Do you, Jim? I don't. I, I, I. Whenever he tweeted or put on his Instagram, like the return to Kentucky is a possibility. My mind immediately went to, okay, Kentucky's boosters are just going to bring him back. John Calipari obviously wants him back, and he was a big part of what Kentucky did last year, and I think he had a big vision for him this year. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's going to be some you know, contact, and they, they might have some dealers out, but Big Blue, Big Blue Nation has some money. <laughs> 
So you're saying Pitt fans should uh, bid adieu to that idea? Not completely, but I'm not banking on it. Come on, don't just give in. Just give in I, and I, laugh I at it, Jim. I, just I give in. Do. It's funny. It's you good. It was joke. funny. It um, was funny when I made the joke in the group chat group text. It's it's funny now. I just made it twice in the span of like 45 seconds, and it's still funny. It's been funny every time, Jim. Stop stop trying to resist. You know it's funny. And I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna keep doing it again because it's not gonna stop funny. Oh, and 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 earlier, like when you were like, you know, um, you know, there's good players going into the portal every day. And I said, Yeah, today there was a great player went in because that kid from Utah State, his name is great. But you know, nobody nobody picked up on that one. But you know, that one or I didn't say it exactly that way in the group text. I said, like, uh, well, that guy's not just good. <laughs> dot dot dot. And everybody just left me hanging there. You and Steve and Houston and uh Matt, just nobody nobody wanted to go for it. Nobody bit, but you know, I guess uh, you made a hundred you, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take, right? So all right, Jim. Well, I appreciate your time tonight. As always, appreciate everybody who tuned in. Make sure you guys like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Don't miss any of our pit video content. Check out the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com to get all of your pit sports coverage. Thanks again to everybody for tuning in, the chats and the comments and all those things. Like and subscribe, and we will catch up with you tomorrow for the morning pit right here on youtube.com slash